The Silly Goose Gang Podcast. And we are back. Episode 33, Silly Goose Gang Podcast. And we're delighted to be joined this evening by Ryan Mickler from Order of Man. So, Ryan, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening or this afternoon, your time. Yeah, it's this afternoon, but I'm glad to join you guys. Looking forward to the call and discussion today. Excellent. Yeah, it's, um, like I say, off air, we're, we're both fans of um, of your podcast. <clears throat> You've had some real, real interesting conversations recently. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really cool to speak to you, Ryan. So, um, first off, I'd like to say a huge congratulations on the Blue Belt. You just recently got Thank you. Yeah, just a couple of days ago. So that was a good accomplishment. I was really excited and happy about that. So feeling feeling good about my jiu-jitsu journey so far. In fact, I've got uh, some training this evening. So we'll be getting after it this afternoon. Nice. That's cool. Um, when did you start? When, when did that begin? I started training a little over two years ago. I went to a, a week-long jiu-jitsu camp without more than one or two classes uh, under my belt. And I, so I went to that week long jujitsu training with, uh, with origin and enjoyed it. And then I just got busy with life. So I didn't train for a full, full, for a full year before I went back the next year to that, uh, training camp, uh, which was a little over, actually it was just as exactly a year, uh, next week. And uh, that's when I started training very, very heavily. So I, I train four days a week, and I have for the past year. Or so that's okay. so. So when people ask me, it kind of dabbled for a couple of years, but really a full year of of training is what I would say. Yeah, it becomes uh, you know, it always becomes such an addictive <clears throat> thing. It's um, it's so much fun, so much fun. So um, so is the origin thing is that. Uh, is that a, a thing with with Jocko? Is that through through that company or? Yeah. So Pete Roberts is the founder of Origin, and okay. Jocko is his business partner. So primarily oh, right, came okay. on through. And I don't I don't know the specifics. I'm I'm not part of Origin. They're just really close friends. But uh, okay. yeah, Jocko came in primarily through the nutrition division. So they have the supplements, uh, the 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 milk and the discipline and the go and the joint warfare and everything they do uh, through Origin, uh, but under Jocko's name, if that makes sense. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, I really love what those guys do. You know, just you know, American made. Everything looks like real good quality stuff. It's um. I'm a big a big fan of that. Um, I don't think there's anybody who does anything like that in Scotland. I don't think it's. I just don't think it's possible. Yeah, uh, you know the uh, with with Pete since he's a close friend of mine. We talk uh, just every couple of days or so. Uh, he said really the only other people that are making uh, jujitsu gis are are mostly out of uh, China or Pakistan. So yeah. as far as American made, I mean he's. He's it. I mean, that they're they're the go-to company. So he's been doing a great job, and uh, I'm proud to know him and what he's what he's trying to do, not only for his company, but for America and American manufacturing and uh, just just good quality products using high quality and high caliber people. That's what he's all about. Yeah, is, big, is big it fan mostly, of that. Is it mostly gi jujitsu you've been training, Ryan, or do you kind of jump between that and no gi? What's your preference or your I've, I've only been training gi. I, I, I really, outside of maybe a handful of, of, of classes that we've just done, no gi, um, but primarily it's, it's, it's all gi training. So, uh, you know, I think it's good to round yourself out, but that just happens to be what I've been involved with right, right now and, uh, and, yeah. and trying to master that to some degree anyways. It's, um, yeah, it's uh, quite a different... <sighs> not a different sport but it, it feels really strange when you do predominantly gi to do no gi it's such a because you, you're constantly looking for for grips and they're not there right it becomes a, uh yeah it becomes really so we train um we still train gi but mostly no gi so okay uh, we we train i train four maybe five times a week and it's maybe three no gi sessions and two gi sessions but um i find no gi just way more fun i just find it more fun but um try it to seems to me that 
Yeah, it seems to me just with my limited experience that Nogi is 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 diffi- more difficult for sure because mm-hmm. you don't have anything to grab onto. And then also your gi can be used as a weapon against you, right? So okay. if you're grabbing somebody's collar or lapel, you can use that as a weapon against somebody else. You don't have that option when you're going Nogi. I, I wrestled a little bit in high school, so I have some familiarity with it, with not being able to like grab clothing and things like that. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it, both both practices present their their fair share of challenges. Yeah. And if you're trying to round out what you know your yeah. your ability to protect and defend yourself, then I, I think having a good mix of both would probably be pretty yeah. advantageous for you. Yeah, yeah, fun. absolutely. Yeah, my, my, son, um, my son trains with us as well. Um, he's 17 years old, but he's built like a, a racing snake. He's five foot ten and about 135 pounds. So yeah. he prefers the bogey because he can just slide out. Whereas mm. with the gear, yeah. you know, myself or Chris or one of the you know the the kind of adults grab a hold of his collar, he's like, okay, I'm not getting that back. You've got my collar now. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of he doesn't like the gear for that reason. He prefers the nogi because he's he, he moves like a snake. He's all bendy and. Is a nightmare to get a hold of in the nogi, you know. Uh, yeah, the, the gi, it's always frustrated with it because guys grab him, you know. Guys that are 200, yeah. 200 pounds, he's just he just can't fight against that. It's always interesting to see uh, everybody's body types, and then of course their personalities come into play, and their athleticism, and then you see their mindset. Yeah. You see ultra aggressive guys, you see more passive guys, you see assertive guys, and. What I've found fascinating is that there isn't one body type, for example, that is like, oh, that guy's going to be good at jujitsu because he's built this way. Yeah. It's just yeah. developing your game around your body type, around your personality and style. And, and everybody has, just like your own personality, I see that when I roll with guys, they have their own jujitsu personality. And it's really fascinating to see. Yeah, it's... Um... You know, it's such a, like exactly what you said. There's no so like me and Ali are built absolute polar opposites. So I'm six foot and like two twenty. Ali's like six three and one eighty five, one ninety. So right. Ali's really long and I'm really sh- short and kind of stocky and, and um. But you know, they all everybody pre- presents their own individual problems that you know it's you know problem solving. It's it's uh fantastic things. I've, I mean, have you found? the you know the jiu-jitsu stuff ha, um you know it's applicable to uh, you know even just your podcast the, the problem solving the way, the way of doing things it's yeah you know you i take think it's over. definitely i think it's i mean there's a lot of applicable skills and a lot of applicable lessons i think you do have to be very aware in order to translate those because they're not readily apparent or available you know i i don't think it translates easy necessarily although it's a good metaphor for life uh but if you're actively looking for the lesson in jujitsu i think it's much more applicable to your your everyday life whether that's running a business or dealing with your kids or working with your family or your wife so yeah, for me, um, I've really had to develop a sense of patience that hasn't always been there, and I continue to work on that. You know, I want results, and I want them yesterday. Uh, yeah. With jujitsu, it just doesn't work like that, right? Just like life, and so being able to understand that. You know, another thing that we had just talked about is everybody has their own jujitsu personality. Well, it's the same thing in running a podcast, or the same thing with running a business, or uh, leading your family and friends is. There isn't one mold. There isn't one way to do it. There's certain principles. You know, you guys mm. talk about the differences between your body types. You're all, you, you, all three of us are, are applying the same principles, leverage, yeah. you know, things like that. Although the way that we apply them might just be a little different based on our strengths and our weaknesses. And so life is very much the same way. Uh, I think a lot of the times people uh, tend to believe that, oh, if I don't do it like that successful person, then I'm not going to be successful. No, your job is to extract the lessons, the principles, the foundational principles, and then use your own flavor of 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 management and leadership and communication and uh, all the other skill sets that you have to produce a desirable result for yourself. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely lessons there, but I think it does take uh, an individual who's very self-aware uh, that is able to translate the lessons from jujitsu over into your ordinary everyday life. Yeah, so um, uh, you know, you make a, a very good point, Ryan. Um, I think um, there's very much a, 
a thought that, you know, when you see somebody who's successful, that you have to do something their way. But, you know, everybody's got this path. So, you know, Ali can triangle people really easily. I can't. Sure. That, doesn't, right. that doesn't mean that he's, you know, better at jiu-jitsu than I am. It just means that I have to find another way. So I think, you know, in terms of exactly what you were saying, um, I think we, we look too much at a successful person, you know, whoever it is, you know, whether it's, you know, Gordon Ryan in jiu-jitsu or whether it's uh, Jeff Bezos in business and go, oh, you have to do it this way. It's not, you know, everybody's got their own thing. And I think, uh, you know, the, uh, any combat sport is a very good uh, metaphor for saying, no, there's a million different ways. You have to find what works for you, figure it out and proceed. And then figure out what comes after that and then proceed. Um, it's a, a very good um, tool for progressing and, and, you know, everyday life, I think, anyway. Maybe I'm crazy. No, I think um, that's right. And and the other thing, too, is that a lot of people feel like they're entitled to just know their path because they happen to show up. And we know that's not the case. I don't know how long you guys have been training for, but it takes a lot of time on the mats. And you yeah. don't get to just have the result because you want it or because you show up. Yeah. You have to articulate. You have to learn. You have to develop your own style. And that just takes, frankly, a lot of mat time, a lot of getting beat up and banged yeah. up. And uh, paying your dues, for lack of a better term. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Can, One, you can't shortcut it, can you? There's no way to shortcut it in jiu-jitsu. You have yeah. to put the hours in. Um, I mean, you can watch videos and you can you can read books. And, and I certainly do that. And I think it accelerates the learning process. It really does. Um, but when you watch a video, it seems way easier than when you're actually doing it where there's resistance and somebody's pushing against you. But that's not to say that watching a video or reading a book or studying a technique doesn't have its place. It certainly does. And so I train with guys who – and I spend time you know, watching videos and, 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 and researching. And I've got you know, several books behind me uh, of, of moves and principles. And I think I'm able to accelerate my practice because I look at that stuff and I study it. And then when I go to practice it – and actually put it into practice, I think I'm that much further ahead because of that. So it's not one or the other. You can accelerate through learning. So let's translate this into your, into your life. Uh, it's, it's not that you just need to go into life or your business or whatever endeavor you're on and just be reckless. You, you can study, you can research, you can look at the people who have gone before you and see what they're doing and seeing how they're doing it and then also apply it. And that'll accelerate mm. the the learning process and uh, minimize the uh, the the learning curve that you might otherwise experience. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, on you go, Chris. No, I was just going to say it's um, you know it's interesting. You know, you have to have a very strong fundamental game, and you can apply this to anything. So, um, fundamentally, if you're running a business, you have to have you know you know, think things through, have some financial restraint. Uh, so you have to have good fundamentals before you can do anything. But once you build a solid uh, skill set, like uh, the fundamentals, then you can start to spread things out. So, you know, so just like jiu-jitsu, you have to, you can't do anything fancy uh, until you can pass guard. You, you just can't. So, you know. Well, it's, and, it's, it's and knowing the fundamentals, yeah, I mean, knowing the fundamentals is what allows you to be creative. Right. Yeah. So, so we look at those people who are creative and we think, oh, these are, these are people who are just naturally creative and they just have these great ideas. I, I'd argue that these individuals know better than, than most everybody else, the foundational principles. If you take an artist yeah. who, who paints, for example, and you look at a Picasso, right. And you think, oh, he's just slapping paint on the canvas and there's no rhyme or reason to it. Well, I guarantee you that he's and I don't know for sure, but I would assume he's he's trained. He understands the basic or did understand the basic elements of color and dimension. And yeah. because he knows the fundamentals, it's it's that foundational base that allows him to push the bounds of what was previously thought possible or previously acceptable. So these people who seem to be very creative at the top of their game – it's not that they're reckless. It's that they've gotten so good at the fundamentals and it's now mm. allowed them to experiment in ways that people just have never put together in the, in the past. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, yeah I noticed definitely. as well, just on one of your, 
one of your social media posts just recently, Ryan. I think it was maybe just yesterday or possibly today even. Someone kind of, from from your post, I'd picked up someone and kind of thrown a bit of shade at you getting your blue belt because, oh, it's easy for you because you can, you've got all this time to train and I wish I had the time to train. And you rightly said, hey, we've all got 24 hours. We're all, you know, we've all got the God-given 24 hours a day. It's just, how do you use that 24 hours? You know, if you're sitting watching Netflix for six hours a day, of course you're not going to be as successful as someone that trains four yeah. times a week, three times a week, five times a week, puts in the hours, does the watching, reads up, thinks about it in their head, you know, conceptually when yeah. they're not doing it. And this reflects to anything, not just jiu-jitsu. And, and I saw you kind of came back with it, which is, it's so true. And, and people want to, and again, this isn't a, a particularly pg rate podcast, people want to shit on people when they see people doing well and they're like, well, oh yeah, of course it's easy. Yeah, Ryan can do it because he's got time to do it you know he just he just does a podcast and he's got all this time in the world yeah <laughs> i've actually had it. people no it's 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 a, it's a very interesting thought I, I think we should riff on that a little bit because i've actually had people you know i've had a lot of people say that oh wouldn't it be nice oh it must be nice to be able to have that much time and you know it, it's I, I don't i don't subscribe to to the concept of free time like i don't have free time there isn't okay. a time where I'm like, oh, it's just free and there's no, no purpose or no, no, I don't have that. You know, even when I go to jujitsu in the evenings, I go, I go four times a week. I go twice in the evening as my family's winding down their day and two times per week before my family even gets out of bed. But so people will say, well, that's free time. No, that's not free time. That's time that I've carved deliberately and intentionally out of my day. I sacrifice sleep in the mornings. I sacrifice time with my family in the evenings, but I've deliberately and intentionally carved that time out of my day because it's a priority. Now, if jujitsu or pursuing uh, a side business or getting in shape or whatever it is your thing that you're talking about, if it's not a priority, that's okay. I'm, I'm not telling you you have to have the same priorities as me. But don't you dare fool yourself into thinking that mm -hmm. just because I've managed my time the way that I do, that you could miraculously step into my schedule or step into my life and produce the same results. In fact, I'd argue that if you had my life or if somebody had your life, that it really that, that what you guys have created for yourselves and what I've created for myself actually wouldn't be that much of a factor. If somebody said, well, Ryan, if I had as much time as you, then I'd be able to dot, dot, dot. Well, actually, if you had as much time as I do, you'd be in the same position that you are right now. Not anymore, not any less, because you're exactly where you deserve to be. You're producing mm -hmm. the exact results that you deserve, superior or inferior, but it's all based on the way that you're currently living. So people say, well, if I had more money or if I had more people that believed in me or if I had better connections, dude, you got to develop that. You know, there was times yeah. in my life, I look at myself as a podcaster now um, and, and we're having some relative success. I mean, there was a time in my life where I, I couldn't, I couldn't pay some of my guests enough money to join me in an hour long conversation. Well, now some of those individuals I can reach out and I've been fortunate enough to call some of those people friends, but that isn't something that was just magically bestowed upon me. Like I've spent five and a half years of working my ass off and, and it took a lot of time to, 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 develop what I've created today. These aren't just miraculous results that have just fallen into my lap. We've, we've created this intentionally and deliberately. Yeah. It's, um, I think it's a wonderful thing when you speak to another man who you agree with almost a hundred percent on. It's a, it's a fantastic thing. Um, you know, I, I get so annoyed. Um, you know, people have said to me, cause I, I do quite a lot of different things triathlons and marathons and you know jiu-jitsu and stuff and people will say oh and i i run a business as well ryan uh, not as big as you but i run a little business and uh, you know people have said oh it's okay for you and you go yeah but i i have no idea what's happening in the latest soap on television i have you seen this film no why well i was training for an iron man so i was out fucking right. night at 10, at 10 right. o'clock at night because that's what you have to fucking do there's no magic pill, you know, when, you know, when you see somebody who's uh, maybe a little bit overweight and you say, oh, you know, I just can't. No, yes, you can. Stop putting a calorie surplus in your mouth, be in a calorie deficit and move around a little bit more. This isn't difficult. You can do it. 
you just have to fucking do it. It's really that simple. Um, and I get so annoyed. I think you you put it way way better than I do. But um, you know, I I hundred percent agree. I think people uh, have uh, generally just a false sense of expectations about what it'll take. Like I've had individuals who will reach out, you know, and they'll make snarky, snide comments. They're not legitimate comments, and I get it. They're upset with their life, and so mine seems to be an outlet for that. Uh, but they've, they've reached out and said, you know, it, it must be nice to be able to dink around on social media all day. <laughs> like, yeah, cause that's what I do. Right. Like, like all I do is I just dink around on social media and I've always got my phone in my hand and that's all I'm ever doing. And to those individuals, I say, yeah, you know, it is nice. Why don't you go ahead and try it and, and you'll see how easy and you know, nice it is. But they find out pretty quickly that that's not what it is. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not injured. Look, I, I don't need to entertain these individuals if, if they're upset with their life. And I actually made a post on Twitter about this. I said, you know, I don't have any haters. Uh, I have people who hate themselves and there's nothing I can do about yeah. that. I can't control that. Yeah. You know, all I can do is continue to live my life and hopefully it inspires people along the way. And those people who choose to be inspired, uh, will do something with the information that we share to, to varying degrees. And those people who are so bitter and contentious and upset about their own results uh, will continue to blame me and other people for uh, us having success, but but them not. And uh, there's nothing I can do about that. Yeah. So I just keep driving on. Yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, quite regularly you see, I mean, just, you know, I mean, recently there's been riots and stuff and people get annoyed at, you know, the, the super rich. Oh, these guys are super rich. And it, it's, as, it's as if, you know, these billionaires have become billionaires by absolute luck and chance. And you go, you know, that's not how this works. You know, they have been working 18 hours a day. I mean, I, I guarantee you, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, wasn't on Instagram shitting on Ryan Meckler <laughs> for, for, you know, for going to Jiu Jitsu. He yeah. was working his, he did not have time. For that right. stuff. He has been, you know, Bill Gates, any of these guys, I got, you know, they, they were working. So this idea that, you know, you're not doing well in life because somebody else is really lucky. It's, it's you know, complete nonsense. You know, you, you, you have to put the work in and uh, make good decisions, make good friends and, uh, you know, push forward, you know, as, as uh, you know, rising tide lifts all ships. So um, what's funny about that is, you use that that uh, example of Jeff Bezos, for example, is like, so people say, well, if I had Jeff Bezos' life, I would blah, 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 right? It's like, if you had Jeff Bezos' life, you would go cry yourself to sleep in the corner of your closet within 15 <laughs> minutes because you can't handle the speed and the capacity at which he operates. And and yeah. that's not meant 100%. as an insult, by the way, because I wouldn't yeah. be there either. I, I would, yeah. I would cr literally crumble under the pressure of his life. He has earned the right to be there. And so all I can hope to do is be inspired and then to level up my own life in a way that makes me more capable tomorrow than I am today. But these people who say, well, I wish I had so-and-so's life. My, my friend, Andy Frasilla with MFCEO, actually at Real AF now, uh, Andy Frasilla, he talks about this. You know, I went and visited, are you guys familiar with Andy? Yeah, yeah. we went yeah. to the podcast when you visited his new, uh, his new facility. Right. So I went out there and I, I, it's a beautiful facility. He's created an amazing business. And I told him straight up, I'm like, man, I, I don't think I can handle your life. And he's, and he said without, without any malice, he said, yeah, bro, you couldn't handle it. And he, it wasn't as a slight, it wasn't an insult. He was just saying, yeah, I've the speed at which he operates, the capacity at which he operates, the amount of stress and information he can consume and the, and the rate at which it comes would crumble most men. He's built that up over time and he's earned the right to be there. Yeah. I think that's that's the key, isn't it? People's mindset of they think, oh well it's it's because you've you've lucked into it or you've found some kind of secret, you found some hack. And quite often the hack yeah. is just putting in the work and working hard. And going through the rough times, you know, we, we sometimes, I get guilty of it, you know, we've not been running the podcast for very long. We kind of set up at the start of lockdown here in Scotland, as I say, we're, this is episode 33. And you look at other people's podcasts, like, man, we're not getting anywhere near the views. And I'm like, well, of course not, because I'm looking at episode 700 of their podcast. 
Right. Yeah. That's been out that's been out there, you know, in the, the internet world for five, six, seven years. So it's had time to build up those numbers. We're not gonna hit a million views overnight because we're not Joe Rogan. And sometimes you have to kind of be realistic and say, Yeah, okay, but we're still working, we're still grinding, we're still building something. We're still out I there. I mean Joe Rogan. Yeah, Joe Rogan's a perfect example. You know, he just signed that one hundred million dollar deal with with Spotify, I believe it was, and people are like, Oh, he's mm-hmm. a, oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, he got lucky. Joe Rogan's been in the public eye for three, what, four decades now? Yeah. You know, so yeah. so you're telling me you're going to compare yourself to somebody who's been at this game for 40 years? Like, that's not a yeah. fair comparison. It's not fair to you. It's yeah. not fair to Rogan. Uh, and it only sets yourself up. Forget about the fairness stuff. It only sets yourself up for failure. Because if you're measuring yeah. your results based on what somebody's doing who's been in the game for four decades – Well, you're going to be disappointed, and what you're going to end up doing is throwing in the towel because you're not experiencing the results. Again, that goes back to what we said earlier, false expectations. You know, you look at somebody else's life, and you think you know because you you follow them or get their emails what it is they're doing, and you have no freaking clue what that individual is dealing with. So if you're inspired by somebody, and I I think it's good to be inspired by people, whether it's Rogan or Andy Frasilla or Jocko or any of these people – uh, that I've been fortunate enough to talk with, I don't compare myself to those individuals. I, I choose to be curious, inquisitive. Like, how did this guy do this? How did he create this? What can I mimic in my own life that would produce similar results? Uh, and that's the better way to do it, as opposed to comparing yourself to what they're producing. Ask how they're doing it, and then implement it to the degree that you can in your current situation. Do you um, just just when you're talking about these guys, um, Ryan? Do you? Do you watch silently and and try and figure out what they're doing, or do you ask questions? Uh, I'm pretty slow to ask questions because I feel like I I don't have the right to ask those questions. You know, I don't have any relationship with that individual. And here's the deal that I found for the most part is if I'm reaching out to Andy Frasilla, for example, and I'm and I say. Hey, Andy, I love what you do. Uh, and I send him a DM on Instagram. Uh, I'm just wondering how to grow my business. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. All right. Mm. Number one, all I'm doing is taking, I'm extracting value. And at times that's appropriate. But if you haven't added any value in return, it's not appropriate to extract value or even expect or ask other people to give value to you. It's, it's not a fair request. The other thing is it's a very broad and generalized question. And frankly, it's weak. It's a weak question. Hey, how do you grow your business? Hey, how do you become a better man? How do you start a podcast? Those are all inferior questions to more specific, uh, superior questions, which would be uh, on the business one. Instead of saying, how do I grow my business? A superior question would be, here's my target demographic. Uh, men between the ages of 25 to 45, they've got businesses, they, they've got families, they're conservative in nature, whatever your demographic is. And I'm curious what what you see, what your perspective is on where I can, uh, where where these men seem to congregate. Like, do you see how much more powerful of a question? It's very poignant. It's very specific. Okay, so that's the second problem. Is the second problem is it's you? First problem, you don't have enough value. You're just extracting. You're a taker. Okay. Second problem is it's too general of a question. Third problem is. They've probably answered your question a thousand times already yeah. on their podcast, yeah. through their email courses, through their videos, the book they just wrote. And if you're asking somebody to answer a question that they wrote in their book, dude, go buy their book and yeah. read the book, listen to their podcast, subscribe to their newsletters, watch their videos. And if after doing that for a significant and sustained period of time, you feel like there's still some specific questions and you've added and enhanced enough value in that person's life. I'll give you a prime example. I had a friend of mine reach out to me today. He sent me a text. He's like, hey, Ryan, um, you're connected with so-and-so, uh, and I'd really like an introduction to that person because I think there's some good uh, potential strategic partnerships here. Would you be willing to make that introduction for me? Well, look, if I didn't know that guy, I'd be like, no, I'm not going to make that introduction. But I know this individual. We're friends. We've been friends for years. We spend time together. Our families get together on a regular basis. I know this Mm. individual. He's added value to my life. And of course, when he reaches out and says, hey, will you you make a connection? 
there isn't a there isn't a doubt or a hesitation in my mind at all. Of course, I will do that because if I can add value to your life, I want to be able to reciprocate the value that you've added to mine. But he's earned that right, and most yeah. people haven't earned that right. Yeah, I think um, you know we. You know, I'm, I'm glad now that I can say we have never asked anybody for anything. Um, you know, we haven't asked anybody to. You know, can you share a podcast? Can you do this? Can you do? It? We've just done our own thing. And if we're doing a good job, it will grow. If we're not doing a good job, it won't grow. But we haven't asked for anything. Um, so it will hopefully be organic and grow and, and people like it. Um, but, you know, one thing that's, um, you know, just what you were kind of touching on there is I think, um, I, you know, a lot of people, and I'm sure people have watched, you know, people that probably know me and Ali would say, and other guys, you know, the fucking assholes. Why, why are they doing this? They're not doing a good job. And, you know, jealous. But you're going, well, why don't you do it? This is way more difficult to try and have a nice, positive conversation that's entertaining than anybody can understand because you have to constantly think back and plan ahead. You know, what, what are you going to ask? And, you know, it's very, very difficult. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we we are doing it kind of what you're saying. We're, we're trying to build this thing nice and slowly and organically without asking for favours. You know, because we, we, you know, you know, we know some people um, who, are, who are, you know, semi-famous, I suppose. Uh, but we're not going to ask anybody for favors. Like, can you do this for us to help us? No, I, I, I don't. You know, I don't like. I don't like that idea. I don't want any um, sort of ar- ar- artificial help. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, I understand uh, what you're saying, but but the other side of it too is, and I want to be clear here, is that there are times where it is appropriate to ask for help. And, mm-hmm. and it's, and it's completely reasonable and, uh, it's valid, you know, for example, you know, we're doing this podcast. If you guys came to me and said, Hey, you know, you came on our podcast, we really appreciated the conversation. Well, this helps me, right? Like I'm getting in front of people that I've never met before or would not be exposed to me. Yeah. I don't think it would be unreasonable to say, Hey, here's our, here's the link. If you get a chance to share, would you mind doing that? I think that's a fair request. You know, it, it it's, it's proportionate to the value that you've added to my life. Right. Yeah. It, it's where it becomes yeah. disproportionate. You know, if it's like, hey, can you introduce me to, you know, this individual, but we've never had a conversation in our lives before. OK, that's a disproportionate exchange of value. And it's just not going to make sense. And it's going to disenfranchise mm-hmm. people from you. Yeah, definitely. yeah I, I think, think um, as well, I, I know, what you were saying, right, a little bit about um, personality as well, doesn't it? That definitely plays an element in that and possibly maybe a Scottish thing where you don't, you know, Scots tend to, although we're loud when we're drunk, we tend to be a little bit quieter when we're, you know, in amongst friends that I think so just that's ask when, when you're drunk. That's fine. No problem. Just get <laughs> drunk and get, make all those asks. Hey, Ryan, it's we need you to get something done for us. And then we'll... we'll that's right. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, no, it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. I like, I like your, um, you know, the, the proportionate value is... Um, a good way of, yeah, I like that it's a good uh, a good way of putting it I, I mean I know for a fact that there's a lot of my friends a lot of Ali's friends um, would take a lot from your podcast and a lot of your po- uh, conversations so um, you know hopefully hopefully we can get you some more listeners in Scotland um, but yeah it's it's, it's uh, yeah you know I think my a- goal is to is to blow this up in Scotland at the point where I actually need to come out and visit you guys that that would be the goal here. So let, let's make yeah. that happen, okay? Now, you've we got can, the right color uh... beard for coming over here. <laughs> say, say it again. Did you got the right color beard for coming over? Oh here. yeah, I'd, I'd fit right in, man. I I don't think I'd have any problems. <laughs> we will um we will uh hopefully at some point be in a studio and we can uh we can roll and then uh, have a podcast and maybe have a few beers. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah, that'd be awesome. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean. So where did the, the, the road to the, you know, the Order of Man, where, where did that begin, Ryan? Because it's, it's such a fascinating uh, thing, and I, I really like it. I'm a really a big fan of it. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's the road began on, on my own road, my own path. Uh, and, and I really set out to solve my own problems, really. Uh, I, I, my wife and I had gone through a separation years ago. This was about well, it's almost 11 years ago now. Uh, even if you went even back before that, you know, I grew up without a, a, a permanent father figure in my home. My dad was kind of out of the picture by the time I was three, four years old. I had a couple of stepfathers come into my life. You know, I just didn't have a great role model, uh, for masculinity and what it meant to be a husband and a father. 
So about uh, five and a half years ago, I had another podcast. I was in the financial planning business and I had a podcast geared towards helping doctors with their uh, financial planning needs. And I realized, man, I really love this medium of podcasting, but I don't want to continue to have that same boring, drawn out conversation. So I pivoted, like I said, about five and a half years ago, really with the goal of connecting with men that I was motivated and inspired by. And I thought, well, why would these guys want to connect with me? Again, to back, back to the value conversation, what value do I add to, add to their lives? Uh, and that's why I thought, well, we'll do a podcast. And so these guys can give me uh, free coaching <laughs> and we'll make it available and we'll broadcast it. And from day one, it just, it took off, which is a testament to the fact that men are interested in becoming more proficient, more capable husbands and fathers, leaders in their communities, coaches, mentors, brothers, whatever, whatever facet of life that they're showing up as they want to be proficient. Uh, and I look at order of man as the outlet and the resource to give them the tools required to thrive on whatever front it is they're, they're in, uh, engaging in. So it's, it's been a very rewarding journey. Um, I have a lot of men who reach out, who are motivated and inspired. Uh, a lot of them who are changing their lives, losing weight, starting businesses, rekindling relationships. And every time I get uh, a message or a text or an email like that, it's just a little bit of fuel to the fire that says you're on the right track. I mean, I, I think there's absolutely no question um, that you're on on the right track. Um, it seems right now that just to be a, you know, you know, this term of uh, masculinity, it seems to be, you know, portrayed as being a bad thing. And I think people get, um, you know, really confused between what a man should be and you know what some men become um so i think you know at the minute especially right now there seems to be you know men seem to be under attack for just for being a man you know is, is that a fair comment you think yeah i used to not completely believe in that because attack you know i, I want to be correct with the verbiage are we being attacked that's the that's the thing i'm careful with when i hear words like or phrases like uh like he verbally assaulted me I'm like is that even possible? You know, like yeah. that, that, that is for somebody to verbally assault you. That's not even possible. Right. So, uh, I, I'm careful with the, the words that I choose to use attack. I don't know if attack, but certainly a dismissal, uh, mm. undermining. Uh, and, and I think part of that is because men represent the last line of defense, uh, for a free, society that believes in the power of the individual that believes in family that believes in parents and that isn't completely degenerate like we're seeing in much of society right now and it's engaged fathers it's it's strong assertive husbands it's active community leaders uh who are the last line of defense against the powers that would love nothing more than to dominate every corner and every fabric of society from teaching young children, uh, and more, more accurately indoctrinating young children to becoming, you know, the, the supervisor, the custodian of these children and to turn us all into little cogs in the wheel to keep the powers that be where they are. And, uh, men represent a, a line of defense against that. So it's in their best interest to undermine at a minimum uh, what men actually add as far as value goes and what we bring to the table. Yes, uh, I think um, it's interesting because you can, you can tell now, Ryan, that you've been talking, uh, you know, podcasting for a while and stuff because every little, um, every little detail is very well thought out for the way you speak is it's interesting to just watch you talking about that because you can see uh, that, that you, you're thinking about everything you say, the way you put it. So you put it correctly. It's, it's, a, it's quite an interesting thing just to watch you explain that. Um, how you explain it is, is very interesting. You could tell that you've really thought about this and you obviously, I know you, you know, you're, you're iron council. I know you obviously, um, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of conversation going there. So, um, it's 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 very uh, encouraging the way you 
construct the you know what you're saying it's, it's, a, it's a really cool thing to watch um, i i appreciate that i i i accept that compliment but i've i've really had to work at that that isn't something that comes natural to me uh but but i am a professional communicator uh, that is my job right i'm a, I'm a podcaster uh, I talk with men. I've got the Iron Council, like you had mentioned earlier. And so my job is to communicate. And so I'm constantly looking for more effective ways to communicate with people. And the 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 best way that we have to communicate is the sounds that we're able to make with the the anatomy that we're blessed with, you know. And so words are important. Meaning is important. Uh, articulation and inflection, all that stuff is crucial. And so I, I try to study that uh, because it is a big part of what I do. And ultimately, how we get a message that's important to us out to the people who would be impacted positively by what we share. Yeah, it's, it is a, such a crucial point, Ryan, because in, in my job, I don't run a business. I work for a, a large financial uh, company over here in Scotland. Um, and I'm a trainer, so I train new staff that come into the business. So a little bit like you're saying, almost a professional communicator. My job is to present detailed information, get them up to speed, all the rest of it. But we do a lot of work as a training team around the types of questions which you, you've kind of touched on already, the way that you formulate your questions, the power of your questions, to make sure that everyone's getting the right experience and the same experience and the experience that they need. Um, and people think it's easy. You know, everyone says, oh, you're a trainer, Ali. All you do is stand up and talk all day. And again, it goes back to what we've said. Well, sure, you go up and stand and talk all day. And and just as a little aside, it happened. A guy at work had to cover a, a training session um, a couple of weeks back. And I, I gave him all the information, gave him a bit of coaching, gave him some info. And he came to me at the end. He's like, I can't believe how tough your job is. Like, you yeah. make it, you just come in and start talking. And I'm like, yeah, but you've not seen the four hours of prep I've had to do in the background. So when I stand in front of a group of 15 people, I don't look like an idiot talking about, you know, just whatever it might be, whether it's ISAs, whether it's Visa, whether it's some kind of new product we're releasing, whatever it might be. I need to know that inside out because they're going to ask me questions and I need to be able to answer those questions or know where I'm going to go to get the answer and be and an element of it is being confident enough to go, do you know what? I don't know the answer to that. That's a great question, but I'll find out the answer for you because the minute you blag an answer or lie, you just destroy your credibility at that point. And I think that's what you do so well there, Ryan, is you can see that pause. You didn't just immediately come back with, yeah, or a no, or a, oh, I did it. There was a moment of pause and I could see your eyes looking to think, OK, let's let's just have a think about this. And it makes such a difference, a massive difference. Well, and you think about most of society, we're all very reactive, right? We, mm. we live in a, in a very interesting time. I think social media has driven a lot of this. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, unrest in, in society. And I think a lot of that stems from just a reactionary response, which is primarily driven by emotion. And, and I'm not saying that emotion is bad. We all have emotions, whether you believe we were created or we've evolved into who we are or a combination of both, which is what I happen to believe. Uh, we, we, it's, it's just very important that we don't allow ourselves to be driven by emotion solely, but that we use it as a metric for response. So I'm emotional, I'm angry. Okay, why am I angry? Now let's add some rational thought into the equation. And then you can make a more articulate response as opposed to just being emotionally uh, reactive, which generally leads to poor outcomes for everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I, you know, I wanted to touch on uh, briefly, um, I, I know that I did, I'm not sure if Ali did, but you know, I still go away from these podcasts and I play everything in my head over and over to think, you know, did I do a good job? Did I do, did, you know, did I word this badly? Did I do that? How could I have improved that? Is that something that you did or do you still do that? Or I still do that. I, I call it an after action review. So yeah. specifically in the context of podcasting, I go back and I listen to every single podcast. Yes. I like the sound of my own voice, of course, but <laughs> it's for more than just that. I go back with a very critical ear and I asked myself, from the position of somebody who might be listening, if I did a good job. It's not my own perspective, because my, my perspective is irrelevant. 
because it's not about me. It's about the people who would listen. So I try to place myself in their shoes and then I'll go back and ask myself as I'm listening to a conversation with somebody, uh, did I ask all the right questions? Uh, did I allow the guest to have adequate time to explain themselves? Did I keep mm -hmm. my guest from rattling and droning on and maneuver the conversation in a way that's going to be advantageous to the person listening? Uh, did I ask powerful questions? What questions should I have asked there that maybe I missed? So yes, I go back and I listen to everyone with that ear, not my own ear, but as best I can, my audience's ear so that I can improve the podcast for those who are listening. Yeah, good. It's not just me then. <laughs> I was worried. I was worried that uh, I was maybe crazy. But um, yeah, I've you know I think after um, it might have been Robin, it might have been Robin Drake, I think. Um, mm. And you know, thinking afterwards, oh, did I sound like a fucking idiot there? Or you know, did I ask this right? And you know, I have to think about things. And um, you know, I, I, you know, I've done the same. You know, when I've competed uh, jiu jitsu, you know, you think, oh, you know, I should have done this, or I should, you know, that's um, you know, good to have a critical. A critical mind, I guess. Um, yeah, I'll give you an example of that. So this morning, um, I was at uh, jujitsu this morning with my son, who's twelve, and he came and trained with us. And I could, I noticed that him and I were rolling for a minute, and I noticed him get very discouraged. And we talked a little bit about it in the moment, and then we just went on with with our training. And then afterwards, we got in the truck, and I said, "Were you discouraged today?" He says, "Yeah, I was really frustrated." And it, then he got discouraged about being discouraged. You know, he was like, oh, I shouldn't be discouraged. And I said, no, it's actually okay to be discouraged. You know, it's okay to be frustrated. That actually means that you care about it. Because if you mm. weren't frustrated and you weren't discouraged, you would be flipping about it. It wouldn't be something that's important to you. And, and I asked, I said, is this something that's important to you? And he said, yeah, it is, it is important to me. And I said, good. When you perform less than you think you're capable of, the right emotion to be experiencing is frustration. That is right. Now, society would say, oh, don't be frustrated and don't be down on yourself. And because society accepts mediocrity, in fact, they encourage it. I don't accept mm. that in myself. And I'm certainly not going to accept it in my son. Now, there is a point I will, I will concede that it becomes unhealthy, right? If all you're doing is shitting on yourself yeah. and you're never yeah, yeah. acknowledging the good that you did and how you framed it in the right way or how you performed well in this particular instance, then yeah, it would be very easy to, easy to become overly critical of yourself and, and then end up undermining your own progress and growth and expansion. But a healthy dose of frustration, uh, you know, did I sound like an idiot? As long as it's healthy, that's a good question to ask. I would want to know yeah. that question objectively so that I don't, yeah do that next time and i'm better because i went through that process for myself yeah i mean i'm not uh no i'm not one of those people that um that shits on myself constantly um i give myself credit where it's due i believe and um but you know i constantly think you know it's more just a case of um you know who can i do better and the, the answer is almost always yes Yes, so there's improvement of to be had there, you know, and and how do I get to that? You know, that's more of the case. Um, now I know we're uh, we're, we're approaching an, an hour, um, so you know, I, I wanted to. Can I say something I actually about okay, what you had just said? Because okay. you said, "Can I do better?" and and the answer is always yes. That's a good thing because that's indicative of hope, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 if you look at when people are really really struggling in their lives to the point of uh, being suicidal, for example, they've lost hope. Like if you strip everything else away, they believe that ending their life is, is, is the right course of action versus something positive that could potentially happen in the future if they were to stay alive. That means mm -hmm. they've lost all hope for living. What a tragic situation. So when you say to yourself, so for example... Here's one thing that's very dangerous and not, not a lot of people are talking about with the body, body positive movement. You guys are familiar with this, the body positive movement? Yeah. Just be happy with who you are and how you are and, okay, you're 50 pounds overweight, but love yourself. If you believe or, or convince yourself or try to talk yourself into believing that you've reached the pinnacle of your life, what the hell do you have to live for? Mm. Nothing. 
if you're as good as you think you can get, I mean, take sports. When people think it's not going to get any better than this, what do they do? They retire. Retire, yeah. Right, because it's like, well, there's nothing better than this. I'm, I'm at the pinnacle. I'm only going to get worse. I'm going to retire. And so they throw in the towel. Now, in a sports context, I think that's appropriate. But in life, when you look at your life and you're, you're convincing yourself that everything's perfect and everything's wonderful and you are just the way you are and, and it's okay to be 50 pounds overweight and it's okay not to achieve the results that you're after and you should love yourself for that, what hope do you have for your life? You just stripped away any hope of improvement. When I got up in the morning, I know, although I feel pretty confident with the, the results that I've achieved over life, I know that I'm capable of more. That's not a bad way of looking at it. That's a very optimistic, hopeful way of looking at my life. It's what gets me out of bed, and it what's, it's what drives me to improve on every front that I possibly can. It's hope. It's a good thing. Um, I know, you know, personally, um, so before I uh, started jiu-jitsu, um, I boxed as an amateur, and I was, a, you know, quite a decent amateur. And I got to a level as an amateur and you know I, I boxed internationally and then found a level and I, I, that was as far as I was going to go but instead of going well that's it I went okay that's probably my level what's next okay jiu-jitsu let's try yeah. jiu-jitsu and you know then I went eh, can I run a marathon fuck yeah uh, I'd like to do a try you know so it's never the end of the road it's just um what else, what else can I, you know, what else is there? Um, it's a pivot or an evolution yeah. is how I choose to frame it, right? Is, yeah, is because, definitely. and think about it this way. Boxing makes you better at jujitsu. Not that you're striking necessarily, but there's some leverage and there's some athleticism yeah. and there's some conditioning. There's yeah. things that go into boxing that although yeah. they don't directly relate, there are some other things that make you better at jujitsu. You're going to be a yeah. better runner because you've trained in boxing and jujitsu. You're going you're gonna to have more of a likelihood to complete a triathlon because you've ran a marathon in the past. So yeah. some people will say, oh, man, I wasted 10 years of my life chasing this thing, and now I'm over here chasing this thing. It wasn't a waste. That 10 years yeah. is what got you to the point where you are now, and you have 10 years of experience that translates over to your new thing. So it's not necessarily that you're throwing in the towel. It's that you've decided to grow, to evolve, to expand – past your current situation into something that's going to push you into a, a further place. At some point, I'm sure for you, you decided boxing is no longer serving me to the degree that I would like it to. And I think that jujitsu will. And so you traveled that path and that was a good decision for you. Yeah. I mean, even now, um, there's still things in my head that I go, okay, I think at some point I would like to see how strong I could get. So, you know, I'm already, you know, fairly strong in terms of powerlifting. I haven't competed, but, you know, I already look at... So in the back of the head, stored away, I have this, like, at some point, I'm going to have a go at this. I would like to see how far I can run. Uh, I would like to see how far I can swim. You know, so I have all these, you know, uh, all these things in my head to see how far I can continue to, um, right. to push myself. Um, you know, as same as the podcast, like, how far can we, you know... Um, uh, you know, I guess I'm eternally positive and uh, it's always a case of, you know, what can I achieve? Uh, you know, I mean, if you had said at the start of this year that me and Ali would be sitting here talking to Ryan Mickler, you would have said, no way. Why? You know, that's not going to happen. But, you know, we started a podcast. You, you know, start asking people. It's just constant progression. And I think, um, you know, the way, you know, I, and I'm, I'm sure somebody said or this you the somebody uh, I think it was your podcast um you know like the way the way you do anything is the way you do everything and sure. um you know that's the way we you know we try and um approach everything so uh, yeah we're we're um we're having fun with life and uh hopefully you know we can help some of our friends um uh, you know like you're helping a lot more people but uh, we we're trying to do something similar here um and having fun doing it. And what else could you ask for in life? It's a good way to live life, for sure. And I'm sure you guys are already helping more people than you even realize. 
it's, it's, hope, it's been yeah. interesting. It has been interesting how many people from both sides of mine and Chris's friends have got in touch and been like, "Man, I love that podcast." And at first, me and Chris are like, "Are they having a? Are they taking the mick a little bit here? Are they taking the piss?" Like it's just <laughs> it's me and Chris talking to people, and then they're like, "No, it was really, like like you guys are really good. Like we, I'm really enjoying it, and we get people, and obviously not to the same level you do, but." You must get that as well. There must be sometimes an element where maybe you're sat opposite someone, whatever name it might be, and you're like, man, if I think back to five and a half years ago and I'm giving out financial advice to doctors, and now I'm sat opposite whoever it might be. Yeah. Where David Ryan Boggins or, or whoever, ago, yeah. Yeah, Ryan from five years ago will be like, really, you got, like, within five years, you got to that. Like, is there points mm. where you kind of, I know you put the work in and everything else, but there are points where you kind of pinch yourself and go, Damn. Yeah, de- there are definitely points like that where you think, man, this isn't real. Or somebody comes and says, you know, I'm really inspired. Or I listen to your podcast all the time. And still I catch myself saying, initially, my knee jerk reaction is like, why? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> why are you listening? Like, There's plenty of other people to listen to over my stuff. Um, so it's surreal. It's a real honor to be able to do it. It's It's humbling and inspiring to know that there are people who are that's this is crazy what i'm about to say there's people who are living a better life because i'm podcasting that's a wild thought to me but it's the truth and it's it's very cool to be a part of somebody's life even to a small degree like that yeah i mean again it's not on your level ryan but um so i have a i have a friend he actually just lives across the road um and I helped him on Sunday do... Now, my friend Danny, he was uh, an international boxer himself. He had arthritis. Um, he's since had a hip replacement. He's 35 years old, same as me. He took me... He became my boxing coach, took me to international level. Uh, you know, he gave bone marrow to his sister because she had cancer. And, you know, I do these... You know, I, I'm one of these people who will just go... You know, I'm going to go to France, you know, Mont Blanc and run a marathon. Uh, I'm going to go and do one of the world's hardest Ironmans. And he's always came along with me because I've always said, I want you to be with me because you're you know, he's one of my best friends. But, you know, on Sunday, he did, you know, a challenge where you, you run 30 miles over 24 hours. Mm. And I know that without without me, he would never have got to that stage because he was never exposed to this stuff. So, you know, I helped him. Uh, I paced him for some of his runs, and it's cool for me to be able to say, "I know that without me, that you would never have done that." So I've made yeah. you do something, and he raised a lot of money for um for diabetes, you know, type one diabetes because his his little girl had uh, type one diabetes, so he was he was doing the run for that. So it's like you're saying, it's really cool to know that although I didn't do it, I'm kind of the catalyst behind that happening. You know what I mean? It's um sure. You know because you know I'm trying to be a positive influence on as many people as possible. So to see that happening is something that's you know pretty special. It is. It's uh, it like you like like you said. It's you know you're you're a part of that, and whatever degree you play is still an important component of it. So yeah, we ought to not discount ourselves for what we what we do and how we contribute to people's lives it's it's really really important stuff um now one of the things i want to say um you know before we have to wrap up ryan uh i had you know i got one of your uh one of your wallets one of your oh perfect uh, your nice little wallets and i got um, we probably got a uh, pin in our map for you if uh because we yeah. have this map and uh i don't know if you saw it but um my son and i put it up so whenever somebody orders something you, we put a pin in where they ordered it from. So having having your order was probably something that was really special to us. So that's cool. Thank you for the support. So, yeah, and and I got um you know the little the little card you know with uh, the twelve yeah. year old uh you know saying that he's you know he's working for dad and he's right. in charge of yeah. orders. Um, you know I shared it on Instagram and, and you reposted it. So uh, I think that's super cool. Really really cool to be able to do that. And I suppose you know again. You know, a twelve-year-old saying, "Wow, something." You know, probably think it's cool that something's going to Scotland. Uh, oh, he loves it. Uh, he loves yeah. it. So, what I um, what I will do is I am working on a, a rash guard just now. Um, I've I've designed a couple of rash guards before, um, and uh-huh. when I get them uh, designed, I'll I'll send you the design once we're finished. Actually, it's really cool. I'll send you. 
I'll, I'll send you and the kid one um, once they're done around about October time. I'll, uh, okay. I'll send you. I'll send you guys uh, one out each because um, sounds great. I'd like, to, I'd like to give something back to you guys. Um, yeah, thank you. So yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, you know, it's nice to be nice. Um, uh, For sure. Yeah. No, I'm excited yeah. to see that. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we have to add. Have you got? Is that your out of time, Ryan? Well, I'm sorry. What was that? I'm just. Are you out of time? Is that, you know you said you're an hour. Is that you? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. What, whatever. If we have more, we want to discuss or whatever, go through. I'm. I'm happy to do that. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, you did. Um, what What did you do in Iraq? What What was your Was your role there? Were you army so, or, or uh, yeah, army. So I joined the National Guard when I was still in high school. And then when you as a National Guard soldier, you when you're activated, you transfer over to, to the army is kind of how that works. Uh, so, yeah, we were in Ramadi in 2005. Um, we had a base defense mission, ensuring that our base was secure. Uh, we had a patrol mission, uh, which was going out into the city and looking for insurgents. Uh, and then we had a small counterfire mission, which is if we ever got attacked with rockets or mortars or any tar- type of artillery, then we were to counterfire on that and, and uh, neutralize the threat. So uh, primarily what I did is, is base defense. Most of my time in Iraq okay. was there, uh, ensuring that the base was secure and safe and that the soldiers and Marines stayed, stayed alive. Cool. Yeah, I know. Um, I it was we, one of those uh, one of those tough areas. I had a couple of friends that were in the Royal Marines that went to uh, Ramadi and then to Fallujah. Uh, yes, and they said that it was a uh, it was an interesting part of the country to <laughs> to put not too fine a point on it. Very intense time. Um, you know, there wasn't a day that went by that we didn't get hit with rockets and mortars. Uh, but it, so it was it was a, a it was intense. Um, but you know, I'm proud of that service and glad I I had the opportunity to take take part in that no definitely it's, it's yeah, important I thing I was, no i was just going to say because i think you have you've spoke to clint emerson as well is that right you're clint yeah on. clint's been on two or three times now uh-huh yeah yeah we've spoke to him as well um he's uh, solid as they come yeah he's uh, a love a lovely a lovely guy who's uh, slightly slightly terrifying uh he's terrifying <laughs> Well, his book, you know, the right the right kind of crazy, you know, that's that pretty well articulates who he is. So a lot of these guys are like that. You wouldn't think anything of them until you got into a situation and think, ah, oh, this is the guy I want in my corner. Yeah, we, we had, had uh, a, when we had him on the podcast. I just read right kind of crazy, um, mm. and he, was, he talks in the book about the assassin test, <laughs> and uh, we got to talk about it on the podcast, and we we clipped it down to one of our most viewed clips, like the kind of two minutes of him just saying. Well, I always had this idea of you know like this this <laughs> assassin group that could travel the world and you know and uh, you'd, be, you'd be in a suit and it'd be like oh so Mr Emerson tell us a bit about yourself what's your education and then you go into another room and there's just a cat and a hammer <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and, then you, and then you come out of that room and you go so Mr Emerson you're back in your suit and it's and then you go into another room and there's a goat and a brick <laughs> and he's just like, oh, uh, doing like and he goes and it's just that idea of being that that high function just to move from, as you say, you know, completely unassuming, not looking like anything, you know, he's not in the nicest way in the world. He's not built like half Thor beyond to, you know, the mountain from Game of Thrones where you look at him as like, Jesus, you know, people that don't know think that's, that's what the scary thing is. For his guys that have to know, it's the guys with the mangled ears and the look in the eyes that you have to be worried about. That's right. You wouldn't even see it coming. So, yep, exactly. And he was saying you need to be able to be yeah, that guy who can just switch it on and then immediately switch it back off. You can't be uncontrolled. You can't be wild. You can't be crazy. It's, it's that switch. You're like, oh, yeah, nice mm-hmm. to meet you. Thanks very much. And then they turn their back and you stab them in the back of the skull. And then you walk away <laughs> and you go, taxi. And there's no panic. There's no run. And me and Chris were just like, yeah, you are the right kind of crazy, Mr. Emerson. Yes, just like... <laughs> yes he is. That is a man you want in your <laughs> corner, for sure. He is. He definitely is. Um, a, a really nice guy. Um, yeah, we, we've spoke to... We've been lucky to speak to two, three Navy SEALs. Um, Jason, Jason Gardner. Gardner. Is that a, you've had one as well. Jason, yeah. uh, have you spoke to Jason? Uh, same, really nice guy. Yeah, Jason's um, been he, on the podcast. He was one of the guys where... 
Um, the, the podcast was fine. When he really came alive was when he started talking about war stories. And his eyes lit up, and he was he was he was away having the time of his life telling us stories about you know oh yeah fight, you know you know being pinned down by the Taliban and fighting them off and yeah it was it was a uh, I really enjoy speaking to to military guys uh, they have a a unique sense of uh, you know the world you know what what really is going on and, and what's important and how to how to function under under extreme uh, pressure um, so you know. I, I really like speaking to to those guys. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, pretty, uh, they're some pretty special people. You wouldn't think that of Jason, where he's you know fa- very family oriented. He's got his homestead, he's got a garden and livestock, yeah. and he can kill you with his bare hands. You know, so it's uh, it's, <laughs> it's it's an interesting dichotomy for sure. It's so yeah. true. Cause we said at the end of every episode, as we'll do with this one, we always say, you know, where can people find out a bit more about you? And he went straight into the story about, oh, my wife runs this uh, Instagram site and she's got a YouTube channel and we show the pictures of our farmmen and our homestead yep. and our horses. <laughs> Please put that out there. And we're like, absolutely. Literally, yeah. tell what he's talking about, as you say, pinned down and uh, not battering. As you say, he could literally kill you with his bare hands, but he's, he's yeah. such a, an absolute gentleman. Absolutely. Yeah, I, like, I like these guys. I like these guys. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I was going to ask you um because you is something that um, you know I've stolen from from your podcast, and I'm going to change it specifically for you. Uh, so you always ask, you know, you've asked people, um, you know, what does it mean to be a man? I'm going to ask you, what does it mean to be American? American. Yeah. The reason, the reason, you know, I, I think Jen is because America is seen as being kind of the leader in the world. So America's kind of seen, you know, in terms of everything. So what does it mean to you to be an American? Um, I, I think, you know, at its root, what it means to be an American is just uh, an individual ideology of, of who you are and how you want to lead your life. Uh, I, I think we're very individualistic, uh, obviously believe in, in freedom and liberty um, at the expense of, you know, our own safety and well-being at times. And I, I think the value that Americans have more than potentially other countries, I'm not familiar with every country, of course, is that that rugged individualism is bred into us. It's the way we were born. It's the way we're raised. It's what we value. And uh, there's something to be said for that. You know, like I, I don't want I don't want people with their thumb over me. I don't want people telling me how to run my life and how to live my life and what I can and can't do. And I'm willing mm-hmm. to fight for that. I'm willing to die on that hill. And, and I think throughout the world, not not everybody, but I think throughout the world, that's a very hard thing to find. Uh, and, and I think the world's a better place, frankly, because uh, we're willing to fight for our liberty and our freedoms. And we don't always get it right. And we're looked at probably somewhat abrasive and can be real assholes and cowboys and whatever else, however people choose to look at Americans generally. But, man, that rugged individualism is something that's been invaluable in my life and i think it's uh to the betterment of this this planet for sure see that's that's what i was hoping you were going to say um you know i think especially what's portrayed in the media just now you know about america um it seems like it's maybe like a little lost as a country you know it feels like maybe it's a little lost at the minute um Maybe it's losing its values. You know, I, you know, the UK is exactly the same. Um, but yes, I'm glad. You know, you said what I, what I was hoping you were going to say. Um, I think uh, you're right see- in that in that America, in a lot of ways, has has lost a lot of its way. Um, more and more people believe that the government is the solution and the answer and can solve all their problems. More and more people are wanting to absolve any sort of individual and personal responsibility for their own lives. Frankly, that's not an American way of looking at things. It really isn't. Uh, And it's unfortunate. I hope we can regain and recapture some of that back because, um, well, it's my belief that nobody, including the government, can do it any better than you can do for yourself. So I would like people to get the hell out of my way and let me lead my my family and myself the way that I best see fit because I can do it better than anybody else. That's... uh a fantastic way to put it and i think uh you know i think you're a a very important person at this uh, point in time uh ryan i think uh you know 
for you know for everybody um you know the way that you you know the way that you think is almost exactly the way that me and ali think um uh, you know and i think a lot of people would benefit from listening and to your conversations and um you know adjusting the way that they think um so yeah it's been a you know i don't want to take too much of your time because we're well over an hour now so uh uh it's been uh yeah it's been it's been a fantastic conversation and um yeah, it's been a real pleasure for us. Uh, Thank you, guys. Hopefully, Appreciate hope, the opportunity. Hopefully we, hopefully we didn't suck too badly. Um, <laughs> no, not at all. It was a great conversation. I'm actually looking forward to figuring out how I can get out to Scotland, when that's actually going to happen, and and get out there, and maybe we can do this live, which would be even better than doing it over the phone or Skype. So. Yeah, absolutely, Definitely man. Swing over. Chris has got a spare room. Uh, the spare room. If you're coming on, if you're coming on your own, you're welcome to stay with me. Um, if you're coming with a family, I could tell you the cool trails to go. You know the cool hills to climb, and you know. Yeah. Um, it would yeah, be with my family. My family goes everywhere with me, so there there's six of us. We it, it's a package deal, man. You get one of us, you get all of us. So. <laughs> yeah, I've got well, five. I've got two sons and a daughter, so uh, I feel we are paying at times. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's uh, definitely. It's busy, but it's good. It's the best way to live. Just for anyone that's, that's not aware of you, Ryan, where would people find you on the internet, social media? Where could we send people to get more information about your good self? Yeah, so uh, the podcast is a great place. You're listening to a podcast now. So if you just type in Order of Man, wherever you're listening to this, you can find it. Uh, I would also give you the link, orderofman.com slash battle ready. We've got a 30-day email course that's available, so I would suggest guys check that out. Um, outside of that, you can find us on all the socials, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever it is, uh, all at Ryan Mickler. My last name's M-I-C-H-L-E-R. So between those several resources, you'll find everything what we're doing. Awesome. And I'll give out, uh, I've got your Battle Ready course. I subscribed to it um, a couple awesome. of weeks ago. It's been a tremendous course. It's been a... Interesting Good. to have a read through of it and start putting some of that into practice. So I'll give out a, a shining endorsement for what it's worth. Good, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Awesome. awesome. Well, I think, as you say, just about winding down, Chris. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm good. Um, I think this is about, yeah, you know, I usually find around about an hour, 10, 15 is a nice amount of time. Otherwise, it just kind of... You know, you're asking questions that don't really need to be asked, and it kind of drags out a sure. little bit. But um, we um, could, yeah. uh, you know, we could we could always do this do this again at some point, Ryan, in the future. Um, we would we would love to talk to you again. I know I have yeah way more. You know, I have to go and think about things and to, to ask you other questions rather than just asking questions that I don't have to ask at the minute. Um, so yeah, I'd rather think about it and come back to you at a later date. Um, but yeah, it's been awesome, and we'd we'd love to speak to you anytime. Uh, like I say, if you cool. if you do come to Scotland, you guys let me know. Scotland. Uh, if you do come to Scotland, let us know and we will tell you the cool places to go and see and uh, stay and eat and all sorts. Um, and we can roll Perfect. and maybe do something live. That'd be awesome. That'd be Absolutely. great. I love it. I'll let you guys know for sure. Sweet. Awesome, well, man. episode 33, Ryan Mickler from Order of Man. Done and dusty. Thanks so much for your time, Ryan. Thank you. Silly Goose Gang Podcast.